Chapter 5 of The Game of Life and How to Play It The Law of Karma and the Law of Forgiveness Man receives only that which he gives. The game of life is a game of boomerangs. Man's thoughts, deeds, and words return to him sooner or later with astounding accuracy. This is the law of karma, which is Sanskrit for comeback. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For example, a friend told me this story of herself, illustrating the law. She said, I make all my karma on my aunt. Whatever I say to her, someone says to me. I am often irritable at home when one day said to my aunt, who was talking to me during dinner, No more talk. I wish to eat in peace. The following day I was lunching with a woman with whom I wished to make a great impression. I was talking animatedly when she said, No more talk. I wish to eat in peace. My friend is high in consciousness, so her karma returns much more quickly than to one on the mental plane. The more man knows, the more he is responsible for. And a person with a knowledge of spiritual law, which he does not practice, suffers greatly in consequence. The fear of the Lord, law, is the beginning of wisdom. If we read the word Lord, law, it will make many passages in the Bible much clearer. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord, law. It is the law which takes vengeance, not God. God sees man perfect, created in his own image, imagination, and given power and dominion. This is the perfect idea of man, registered in divine mind, awaiting man's recognition. For man can only be what he sees himself to be, and only attain what he sees himself attaining. Nothing ever happens without an onlooker, is an ancient saying. Man first sees his failure or success, his joy or sorrow, before it swings into visibility from the scenes set in his own imagination. We have observed this in the mother picturing disease for her child or a woman seeing success for her husband. Jesus Christ said, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So we see freedom from all unhappy conditions comes through knowledge, a knowledge of spiritual law. Obedience precedes authority. And the law obeys man when he obeys the law. The law of electricity must be obeyed before it becomes man's servant. When handled ignorantly, it becomes man's deadly foe. So with the laws of mind. For example, a woman with a strong personal will wished she owned a house which belonged to an acquaintance, and she often made mental pictures of herself living in the house. In the course of time, the man died, and she moved into the house. Several years afterwards, coming into the knowledge of spiritual law, she said to me, Do you think I had anything to do with that man's death? I replied, Yes, your desire was so strong, everything made way for it. But you paid your karmic debt. Your husband, whom you loved devotedly, died soon after, and the house was a white elephant on your hands for many years. The original owner, however, could not have been affected by her thoughts had he been positive in the truth, nor her husband, but they were both under karmic law. The woman should have said, feeling the great desire for the house, Infinite intelligence, give me the right house, equally as charming as this, the house which is mine by divine right. The divine selection would have given perfect satisfaction and brought good to all. The divine pattern is the only safe pattern to work by. Desire is a tremendous force and must be directed in the right channels or chaos ensues. In demonstrating, the most important step is the first step, to ask a right. Man should always demand only that which is his by divine right. To go back to the illustration, had the woman taken this attitude, if this house I desire is mine, I cannot lose it. 
If it is not, give me its equivalent. The man might have decided to move out harmoniously had it been the divine selection for her, or another house would have been substituted. Anything forced into manifestation through personal will is always ill-got and has ever bad success. Man is admonished, My will be done, not thine. And the curious thing is, man always gets just what he desires when he does relinquish all personal will, thereby enabling infinite intelligence to work through him. Stand ye still and see the salvation of the Lord, law. For example, a woman came to me in great distress. Her daughter had determined to take a very hazardous trip, and the mother was filled with fear. She said she had used every argument, had pointed out the dangers to be encountered, had forbidden her to go, but the daughter became more and more rebellious and determined. I said to the mother, You are forcing your personal will upon your daughter, which you have no right to do, and your fear of the trip is only attracting it, for man attracts what he fears. I added, Let go and take your mental hands off. Put it in God's hands and use this statement. I put this situation in the hands of infinite love and wisdom. If this trip is the divine plan, I bless it and no longer resist. But if it is not divinely planned, I give thanks that it is now dissolved and dissipated. A day or two after that, her daughter said to her, Mother, I have given up the trip. And the situation returned to its native nothingness. It is learning to stand still, which seems so difficult for man. I will deal more fully with this law in the chapter on non-resistance. I will give another example of sowing and reaping, which came in the most curious way. A woman came to me saying she had received a counterfeit $20 bill given to her at the bank. She was much disturbed, for, she said, the people at the bank will never acknowledge their mistake. I replied, let us analyze the situation and find out why you attracted it. She thought a few moments and exclaimed, I know it. I sent a friend a lot of stage money just for a joke. So the law had sent her some stage money, for it doesn't know anything about jokes. I said, now we will call on the law of forgiveness and neutralize the situation. Christianity is founded upon the law of forgiveness. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the karmic law, and the Christ within each man is his redeemer and salvation from all inharmonious conditions. So I said, Infinite Spirit, we call on the law of forgiveness and give thanks that she is under grace and not under law and cannot lose this twenty dollars which is hers by divine right. Now, I said, go back to the bank and tell them, fearlessly, that it was given you there by mistake. She obeyed and, to her surprise, they apologized and gave her another bill, treating her most courteously. So knowledge of the law gives man power to rub out his mistakes. Man cannot force the external to be what he is not. If he desires riches, he must be rich first in consciousness. For example, a woman came to me asking treatment for prosperity. She did not take much interest in her household affairs, and her home was in great disorder. I said to her, if you wish to be rich, you must be orderly. All men with great wealth are orderly, and order is heaven's first law. I added, you will never become rich with a burnt match in the pincushion. She had a good sense of humor and commenced immediately putting her house in order. She rearranged furniture, straightened out her bureau drawers, cleaned rugs, and soon made a big financial demonstration, a gift from a relative. The woman herself became made over and keeps herself keyed up financially by being ever watchful of the external and expecting prosperity, knowing God is her supply. 
Many people are in ignorance of the fact that gifts and things are investments and that hoarding and saving invariably lead to loss. There is that scattereth and yet increaseth. There is that withholdeth more than is meet, but it tendeth to poverty. For example, I knew a man who wanted to buy a fur-lined overcoat. He and his wife went to various shops, but there was none he wanted. He said they were all too cheap-looking. At last he was shown one, the salesman said was valued at $1,000, but which the manager would sell him for $500 as it was late in the season. His financial possessions amounted to about $700, The reasoning mind would have said, you can't afford to spend nearly all you have on a coat. But he was very intuitive and never reasoned. He turned to his wife and said, if I get this coat, I'll make a ton of money. So his wife consented, weakly. About a month later, he received a $10,000 commission. The coat made him feel so rich, it linked him with success and prosperity. Without the coat, he would not have received the commission. It was an investment paying large dividends. If man ignores these leadings to spend or to give, the same amount of money will go in an uninteresting or unhappy way. For example, a woman told me on Thanksgiving Day she informed her family that they could not afford a Thanksgiving dinner. She had the money but decided to save it. A few days later, someone entered her room and took from the bureau drawer the exact amount the dinner would have cost. The law always stands back of the man who spends fearlessly with wisdom. For example, one of my students was shopping with her little nephew. The child clamored for a toy, which she told him she could not afford to buy. She realized suddenly that she was seeking lack and not recognizing God as her supply. So she bought the toy and on her way home, picked up in the street the exact amount of money she had paid for it. Man's supply is inexhaustible and unfailing when fully trusted, but faith or trust must precede the demonstration. According to your faith, be it unto you. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For faith holds the vision steady, and the adverse pictures are dissolved and dissipated, and in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Jesus Christ brought the good news, the gospel, that there was a higher law than the law of karma, and that that law transcends the law of karma. It is the law of grace or forgiveness. It is the law which frees man from the law of cause and effect, the law of consequence. Under grace, not under law. We are told that on this plane, man reaps where he has not sown. The gifts of God are simply poured out upon him. All that the kingdom affords is his. This continued state of bliss awaits the man who has overcome the race or world thought. In the world thought, there is tribulation. But as Jesus Christ said, Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. The world thought is that of sin, sickness, and death. He saw their absolute unreality and said sickness and sorrow shall pass away and death itself, the last enemy, be overcome. We now know from a scientific standpoint that death could be overcome by stamping the subconscious mind with the conviction of eternal youth and eternal life. The subconscious, being simply power without direction, carries out orders without questioning. Working under the direction of the superconscious, the Christ or God within man, the resurrection of the body would be accomplished. Man would no longer throw off his body in death. It would be transformed into the body electric, sung by Walt Whitman, for Christianity is founded upon the forgiveness of sins and 
an empty tomb. End of chapter 5. Chapter 6 of The Game of Life and How to Play It. Casting the Burden. Impressing the Subconscious. When man knows his own powers and the workings of his mind, his great desire is to find an easy and quick way to impress the subconscious with good, for simply an intellectual knowledge of the truth will not bring results. In my own case, I found the easiest way is in casting the burden. A metaphysician once explained it in this manner. He said, The only thing which gives anything weight in nature is the law of gravitation. And if a boulder could be taken high above the planet, there would be no weight in that boulder. And that is what Jesus Christ meant when he said, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. He had overcome the world vibration and functioned in the fourth dimensional realm where there is only perfection, completion, life, and joy. He said, Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We are also told in the 55th Psalm to cast thy burden upon the Lord. Many passages in the Bible state that the battle is God's, not man's, and that man is always to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. This indicates that the superconscious mind, or Christ within, is the department which fights man's battle and relieves him of his burdens. We see, therefore, that man violates law if he carries a burden, and a burden is an adverse thought or condition, and this thought or condition has its root in the subconscious. It seems almost impossible to make any headway directing the subconscious from the conscious or reasoning mind, as the reasoning mind, the intellect, is limited in its conceptions and filled with doubts and fears. How scientific is it, then, to cast the burden upon the superconscious mind, or Christ within, where it is made light or dissolved into its native nothingness? For example, a woman in urgent need of money may light upon the Christ within, the superconscious, with the statement, I cast this burden of lack on the Christ within, and I go free to have plenty. The belief in lack was her burden, and as she cast it upon the superconscious with its belief of plenty, an avalanche of supply was the result. We read, The Christ in you, the hope of glory. Another example. One of my students had been given a new piano, and there was no room in her studio for it until she had moved out the old one. She was in a state of perplexity. She wanted to keep the old piano, but knew of no place to send it. She became desperate, as the new piano was to be sent immediately. In fact, it was on its way, with no place to put it. She said it came to her to repeat, I cast this burden on the Christ within, and I go free. A few minutes later, her phone rang, and a woman friend asked if she might rent her old piano and it was moved out, a few minutes before the new one arrived. I knew a woman whose burden was resentment. She said, I cast this burden of resentment on the Christ within, and I go free to be loving, harmonious, and happy. The Almighty Superconscious flooded the subconscious with love, and her whole life was changed. For years, resentment had held her in a state of torment and imprisoned her soul, the subconscious mind. The statement should be made over and over and over, sometimes for hours at a time, silently or audibly, with quietness but determination. I have often compared it to winding up a Victrola. We must wind ourselves up with spoken words. I have noticed in casting the burden, after a little while, one seems to see clearly. It is impossible to have clear vision while in the throes of carnal mind. Doubts and fear poison the mind and body, and imagination runs riot 
attracting disaster and disease. In steadily repeating the affirmation, I cast this burden on the Christ within and go free, the vision clears, and with it a feeling of relief, and sooner or later comes the manifestation of good, be it health, happiness, or supply. One of my students once asked me to explain the darkness before the dawn. I referred in a preceding chapter to the fact that often, before the big demonstration, everything seems to go wrong, and deep depression clouds the consciousness. It means that out of the subconscious are rising the doubts and fears of the ages. These old derelicts of the subconscious rise to the surface to be put out. It is then that man should clap his symbols, like Jehoshaphat, and give thanks that he is saved, even though he seems surrounded by the enemy, the situation of lack or disease. The student continued, How long must one remain in the dark? And I replied, Until one can see in the dark. And casting the burden enables one to see in the dark. In order to impress the subconscious, active faith is always essential. Faith without works is dead. In these chapters, I have endeavored to bring out this point. Jesus Christ showed active faith when he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground before he gave thanks for the loaves and the fishes. I will give another example showing how necessary this step is. In fact, active faith is the bridge over which man passes to his promised land. Through misunderstanding, a woman had been separated from her husband, whom she loved deeply. He refused all offers of reconciliation and would not communicate with her in any way. Coming into the knowledge of spiritual law, she denied the appearance of separation. She made this statement. There is no separation in divine mind. Therefore, I cannot be separated from the love and companionship which are mine by divine right. She showed active faith by arranging a place for him at the table every day, thereby impressing the subconscious with a picture of his return. Over a year passed, but she never wavered, and one day he walked in. The subconscious is often impressed through music. Music has a fourth-dimensional quality and releases the soul from imprisonment. It makes wonderful things seem possible and easy of accomplishment. I have a friend who uses her Victrola daily for this purpose. It puts her in perfect harmony and releases the imagination. Another woman often dances while making her affirmations. The rhythm and harmony of music and motion carry her words forth with tremendous power. The student must remember also not to despise the day of small things. Invariably, before a demonstration come signs of land. Before Columbus reached America, he saw birds and twigs, which showed him land was near. So it is with a demonstration, but often the student mistakes it for the demonstration itself and is disappointed. For example, a woman had spoken the word for a set of dishes. Not long afterwards, a friend gave her a dish which was old and cracked. She came to me and said, Well, I asked for a set of dishes, and all I got was a cracked plate. I replied, the plate was only signs of land. It shows your dishes are coming. Look upon it as birds and seaweed. And not long afterwards, the dishes came. Continually making believe impresses the subconscious. If one makes believe he is rich and makes believe he is successful, in due time he will reap. Children are always making believe, and except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. For example, I know of a woman who was very poor, but no one could make her feel poor. She earned a small amount of money from rich friends who constantly reminded her of her poverty and to be careful and saving. 
Regardless of their admonitions, she would spend all her earnings on a hat or make someone a gift and be in a rapturous state of mind. Her thoughts were always centered on beautiful clothes and rings and things, but without envying others. She lived in the world of the wondrous, and only riches seemed real to her. Before long, she married a rich man, and the rings and things became visible. I do not know whether the man was the divine selection, but opulence had to manifest in her life, as she had imaged only opulence. There is no peace or happiness for man until he has erased all fear from the subconscious. Fear is misdirected energy and must be redirected or transmuted into faith. Jesus Christ said, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? All things are possible to him that believeth. I am asked so often by my students, How can I get rid of fear? I replied, By walking up to the thing you are afraid of. The lion takes its fierceness from your fear. Walk up to the lion, and he will disappear. Run away, and he runs after you. I have shown in previous chapters how the lion of lack disappeared when the individual spent money fearlessly, showing faith that God was his supply and therefore unfailing. Many of my students have come out of the bondage of poverty and are now bountifully supplied through losing all fear of letting money go out. The subconscious is impressed with the truth that God is the giver and the gift. Therefore, as one is one with the giver, he is one with the gift. A splendid statement is, I now thank God the giver for God the gift. Man has so long separated himself from his good and his supply, through thoughts of separation and lack, that sometimes it takes dynamite to dislodge these false ideas from the subconscious, and the dynamite is a big situation. We see in the foregoing illustration how the individual was freed from his bondage by showing fearlessness. Man should watch himself hourly to detect if his motive for action is fear or faith. Choose ye this day whom we shall serve, fear or faith. Perhaps one's fear is of personality. Then do not avoid the people feared. Be willing to meet them cheerfully, and they will either prove golden links in the chain of one's good or disappear harmoniously from one's pathway. Perhaps one's fear is of disease or germs. Then one should be fearless and undisturbed in a germ-laden situation, and he would be immune. One can only contract germs while vibrating at the same rate as the germ, and fear drags men down to the level of the germ. Of course, the disease-laden germ is the product of carnal mind, as all thought must objectify. Germs do not exist in the superconscious or divine mind, therefore are the products of man's vain imagination. In the twinkling of an eye, man's release will come when he realizes there is no power in evil. The material world will fade away, and the fourth dimensional world, the world of the wondrous, will swing into manifestation. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of The Game of Life and How to Play It Love Every man on this planet is taking his initiation in love. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. Ospensky states in Tertium Organum that love is a cosmic phenomenon and opens to man the fourth dimensional world, the world of the wondrous. Real love is selfish and free from fear. It pours itself out upon the object of its affection without demanding any return. 
Its joy is in the joy of giving. Love is God in manifestation and the strongest magnetic force in the universe. Pure, unselfish love draws to itself its own. It does not need to seek or demand. Scarcely anyone has the faintest conception of real love. Man is selfish, tyrannical, or fearful in his affections, thereby losing the things he loves. Jealousy is the worst enemy of love, for the imagination runs riot, seeing the loved one attracted to another, and invariably these fears objectify if they are not neutralized. For example, a woman came to me in deep distress. The man she loved had left her for another woman and said he never intended to marry her. She was torn with jealousy and resentment and said she hoped he would suffer as he had made her suffer and added, how could he leave me when I loved him so much? I replied, you are not loving that man, you are hating him and added, you can never receive what you have never given. Give a perfect love and you will receive a perfect love. Perfect yourself on this man. Give him a perfect, unselfish love, demanding nothing in return. Do not criticize or condemn, and bless him wherever he is. She replied, No, I won't bless him unless I know where he is. Well, I said, That is not real love. When you send out real love, real love will return to you either from this man or his equivalent, for if this man is not the divine selection, you will not want him. As you are one with God, you are one with the love which belongs to you by divine right. Several months passed, and matters remained about the same, but she was working conscientiously within herself. I said, when you are no longer disturbed by his cruelty, he will cease to be cruel as you are attracting it through your own emotions. Then I told her of a brotherhood in India who never said good morning to each other. They used these words, I salute the divinity in you. They saluted the divinity in every man and in the wild animals in the jungle, and they were never harmed, for they saw only God in every living thing. I said, salute the divinity in this man and say, I see your divine self only. I see you as God sees you, perfect, made in his image and likeness. She found she was becoming more poised and gradually losing her resentment. He was a captain, and she always called him the cap. One day she said suddenly, God bless the cap, wherever he is. I replied, now that is real love. And when you have become a complete circle and are no longer disturbed by the situation, you will have his love or attract its equivalent. I was moving at this time and did not have a telephone, so was out of touch with her for a few weeks, when one morning I received a letter saying, we are married. At the earliest opportunity, I paid her a call. My first words were, what happened? Oh, she exclaimed, a miracle. One day I woke up and all suffering had ceased. I saw him that evening and he asked me to marry him. We were married in about a week and I have never seen a more devoted man. There is an old saying, no man is your enemy, no man is your friend. Every man is your teacher. So one should become impersonal and learn what each man has to teach him, and soon he would learn his lessons and be free. The woman's lover was teaching her selfish love, which every man sooner or later must learn. Suffering is not necessary for man's development. It is the result of violation of spiritual law, but few people seem able to rouse themselves from their soul sleep without it. When people are happy, they usually become selfish, and automatically the law of karma is set in action. Man often suffers loss through lack of appreciation. 
I knew a woman who had a very nice husband, but she said often, I don't care anything about being married, but that is nothing against my husband. I'm simply not interested in married life. She had other interests and scarcely remembered she had a husband. She only thought of him when she saw him. One day her husband told her he was in love with another woman and left. She came to me in distress and resentment. I replied, It is exactly what you spoke the word for. You said you didn't care anything about being married, so the subconscious worked to get you unmarried. She said, Oh, yes, I see. People get what they want and then feel very much hurt. She soon became in perfect harmony with the situation and knew they were both much happier apart. When a woman becomes indifferent or critical and ceases to be an inspiration to her husband, he misses the stimulus of their early relationship and is restless and unhappy. A man came to me dejected, miserable, and poor. His wife was interested in the science of numbers and had had him read. It seems the report was not very favorable, for he said, My wife says I'll never amount to anything because I am a two. I replied, I don't care what your number is. You are a perfect idea in divine mind, and we will demand the success and prosperity which are already planned for you by that infinite intelligence. Within a few weeks, he had a very fine position, and a year or two later, he achieved a brilliant success as a writer. No man is a success in business unless he loves his work. The picture the artist paints for love of his art is his greatest work. The pot boiler is always something to live down. No man can attract money if he despises it. Many people are kept in poverty by saying, Money means nothing to me. I have a contempt for people who have it. This is the reason so many artists are poor. Their contempt for money separates them from it. I remember hearing one artist say of another, He's no good as an artist, but he has money in the bank. This attitude of mind, of course, separates man from his supply. He must be in harmony with a thing in order to attract it. Money is God in manifestation, as freedom from want and limitation. But it must be always kept in circulation and put to right uses. Hoarding and saving react with grim vengeance. This does not mean that man should not have houses and lots, stocks and bonds, for the barns of the righteous man shall be full. It means that man should not hoard even the principle if an occasion arises when money is necessary. In letting it go out fearlessly and cheerfully, he opens the way for more to come in, for God is man's unfailing and unexhaustible supply. This is the spiritual attitude towards money, and the great bank of the universal never fails. We see an example of hoarding in the film production of Greed. The woman won $5,000 in a lottery, but would not spend it. She hoarded and saved, let her husband suffer and starve, and eventually she scrubbed floors for a living. She loved the money itself and put it above everything, and one night she was murdered and the money taken from her. This is an example of where love of money is the root of all evil. Money in itself is good and beneficial, but used for destructive purposes, hoarded and saved, or considered more important than love, brings disease and disaster and the loss of the money itself. Follow the path of love, and all things are added, for God is love and God is supply. Follow the path of selfishness and greed, and the supply vanishes, or man is separated from it. For example, I knew the case of a very rich woman who hoarded her income. She rarely gave anything away, but bought and bought and bought things for herself. She was very fond of necklaces, and a friend once asked her how many she possessed. She replied, 67. She bought them and put them away, carefully wrapped in tissue paper.
Had she used the necklaces, it would have been quite legitimate, but she was violating the law of use. Her closets were filled with clothes she never wore and jewels which never saw the light. The old woman's arms were gradually becoming paralyzed from holding on to things, and eventually she was considered incapable of looking after her affairs, and her wealth was handed over to others to manage. So man, in ignorance of the law, brings about his own destruction. All disease, all unhappiness, come from the violation of the law of love. Man's boomerangs of hate, resentment, and criticism come back laden with sickness and sorrow. Love seems almost a lost art, but the man with the knowledge of spiritual law knows it must be regained, for without it he has become as sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. For example, I had a student who came to me month after month to clean her consciousness of resentment. After a while, she arrived at the point where she resented only one woman, but that one woman kept her busy. Little by little, she became poised and harmonious, and one day, all resentment was wiped out. She came in radiant and exclaimed, You can't understand how I feel. The woman said something to me, and instead of being furious, I was loving and kind. And she apologized and was perfectly lovely to me. No one can understand the marvelous lightness I feel within. Love and goodwill are invaluable in business. For example, a woman came to me complaining of her employer. She said she was cold and critical, and she knew she did not want her in the position. Well, I replied, salute the divinity in the woman and send her love. She said, I can't. She's a marble woman. I answered, you remember the story of the sculptor who asked for a certain piece of marble? He was asked why he wanted it, and he replied, because there is an angel in the marble, and out of it he produced a wonderful work of art. She said, very well, I'll try it. A week later, she came back and said, I did what you told me, and now the woman is very kind and took me out in her car. People are sometimes filled with remorse for having done someone an unkindness, perhaps years ago. If the wrong cannot be righted, its effect can be neutralized by doing someone a kindness in the present. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Sorrow, regret, and remorse tear down the cells of the body and poison the atmosphere of the individual. A woman said to me in deep sorrow, Treat me to be happy and joyous, for my sorrow makes me so irritable with the members of my family that I keep making more karma. I was asked to treat a woman who was mourning for her daughter. I denied all belief in loss and separation and affirmed that God was the woman's joy, love, and peace. The woman gained her poise at once, but sent word by her son not to treat any longer because she was so happy it wasn't respectable. So mortal mind loves to hang on to its griefs and regrets. I knew a woman who went about bragging of her troubles, so, of course, she always had something to brag about. The old idea was, if a woman did not worry about her children, she was not a good mother. Now we know that mother fear is responsible for many of the diseases and accidents which come into the lives of children. For fear pictures vividly the disease or situation feared, and these pictures objectify if not neutralized. Happy is the mother who can say sincerely that she puts her child in God's hands and therefore knows that he is divinely protected. For example, a woman awoke suddenly in the night, feeling her brother was in great danger. 
Instead of giving in to her fears, she commenced making statements of truth, saying, Man is a perfect idea in divine mind and is always in his right place. Therefore, my brother is in his right place and is divinely protected. The next day, she found that her brother had been in close proximity to an explosion in a mine, but had miraculously escaped. So man is his brother's keeper, in thought, and every man should know that the thing he loves dwells in the secret place of the Most High and abides under the shadow of the Almighty. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Perfect love casteth out fear. He that feareth is not made perfect in love, and love is the fulfilling of the law. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of The Game of Life and How to Play It Intuition or Guidance In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths There is nothing too great of accomplishment for the man who knows the power of his word and who follows his intuitive leads. By the word he starts in action unseen forces and can rebuild his body or remold his affairs. It is, therefore, of the utmost importance to choose the right words, and the student carefully selects the affirmation he wishes to catapult into the invisible. He knows that God is his supply, and that there is a supply for every demand, and that his spoken word releases this supply. Ask, and ye shall receive. Man must make the first move. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. I have often been asked just how to make a demonstration. I reply, speak the word. And then do not do anything until you get a definite lead. Demand the lead, saying, Infinite Spirit, reveal to me the way. Let me know if there's anything for me to do. The answer will come through intuition, or hunch, a chance remark from someone, or a passage in a book, etc., etc. The answers are sometimes quite startling in their exactness. For example, a woman desired a large sum of money. She spoke the words, Infinite Spirit, open the way for my immediate supply. Let all that is mine by divine right now reach me in great avalanches of abundance. Then she added, Give me a definite lead. Let me know if there is anything for me to do. The thought came quickly. Give a certain friend, who had helped her spiritually, a hundred dollars. She told her friend, who said, Wait and get another lead before giving it. So she waited, and that day met a woman who said to her, I gave someone a dollar today. It was just as much for me as it would be for you to give someone a hundred. This was indeed an unmistakable lead, so she knew she was right in giving the hundred dollars. It was a gift which proved a great investment for shortly after that. A large sum of money came to her in a remarkable way. Giving opens the way for receiving. In order to create activity in finances, one should give. Tithing, or giving one-tenth of one's income, is an old Jewish custom and is sure to bring increase. Many of the richest men in the country have been tithers and have never known it to fail as an investment. The tenth part goes forth and returns blessed and multiplied, but the gift or tithe must be given with love and cheerfulness, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Bills should be paid cheerfully. All money should be sent forth fearlessly and with a blessing. This attitude of mind makes man master of money. It is his to obey, and his spoken word then opens vast reservoirs of wealth. Man himself limits his supply by his limited vision. Sometimes the student has a great realization of wealth, but is afraid to act. The vision and action must go hand in hand, as in the case of the man who bought the fur-lined overcoat. A woman came to me asking me to speak the word for a position. 
So I demanded, Infinite Spirit, open the way for this woman's right position. Never ask for just a position. Ask for the right position, the place already planned in divine mind, as it is the only one that will give satisfaction. I then gave thanks that she had already received, and that it would manifest quickly. Very soon she had three positions offered her, two in New York and one in Palm Beach, and she did not know which one to choose. I said, ask for a definite lead. The time was almost up and was still undecided when one day she telephoned. When I woke up this morning, I could smell Palm Beach. She had been there before and knew its balmy fragrance. I replied, well, if you can smell Palm Beach from here, it's certainly your lead. She accepted the position and it proved a great success. Often one's lead comes at an unexpected time. One day, I was walking down the street when suddenly I felt a strong urge to go to a certain bakery a block or two away. The reasoning mind resisted, arguing, there is nothing there that you want. However, I had learned not to reason, so I went to the bakery, looked at everything, and there was certainly nothing there that I wanted. But coming out, I encountered a woman I had thought of often and who was in great need of the help which I could give her. So often, one goes for one thing and finds another. Intuition is a spiritual faculty and does not explain, but simply points the way. A person often receives a lead during a treatment. The idea that comes may seem quite irrelevant, but some of God's leadings are mysterious. In the class one day, I was treating that each individual would receive a definite lead. A woman came to me afterwards and said, While you were treating, I got the hunch to take my furniture out of storage and get an apartment. The woman had come to be treated for health. I told her I knew in getting a home of her own, her health would improve. And I added, I believe your trouble, which is a congestion, has come from having things stored away. Congestion of things causes congestion in the body. You have violated the law of use, and your body is paying the penalty. So I gave thanks that divine order was established in her mind, body, and affairs. People little dream of how their affairs react on the body. There is a mental correspondence for every disease. A person might receive instantaneous healing through the realization of his body being a perfect idea in divine mind, and therefore whole and perfect, but if he continues his destructive thinking, hoarding, hating, fearing, condemning, the disease will return. Jesus Christ knew that all sickness came from sin, but admonished the leper after the healing to go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon him. So man's soul, or subconscious mind, must be washed whiter than snow for permanent healing. And the metaphysician is always delving deep for the correspondence. Jesus Christ said, Condemn not lest ye also be condemned. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Many people have attracted disease and unhappiness through the condemnation of others. What man condemns in others, he attracts to himself. For example, a friend came to me in anger and distress because her husband had deserted her for another woman. She condemned the other woman and said continually, She knew he was a married man. She had no right to accept his attentions. I replied, Stop condemning the woman. Bless her and be through with the situation. Otherwise, you are attracting the same thing to yourself. She was deaf to my words and a year or two later became deeply interested in a married man herself. Man picks up a live wire whenever he criticizes or condemns and may expect a shock. Indecision is a stumbling block in many a pathway.
In order to overcome it, make the statement repeatedly, I am always under direct inspiration. I make right decisions quickly. These words impress the subconscious, and soon one finds himself awake and alert, making his right moves without hesitation. I have found it destructive to look to the psychic plane for guidance, as it is the plane of many minds and not the one mind. As man opens his mind to subjectivity, he becomes a target for destructive forces. The psychic plane is the result of man's mortal thought and is on the plane of opposites. He may receive either good or bad messages. The science of numbers and the reading of horoscopes keep man down the mental or mortal plane, for they deal only with the karmic path. I know of a man who should have been dead years ago, according to his horoscope, but he is alive and a leader of one of the biggest movements in this country for the uplift of humanity. It takes a very strong mind to neutralize a prophecy of evil. The student should declare, Every false prophecy shall come to naught. Every plan my Father in heaven has not planned shall be dissolved and dissipated. The divine idea now comes to pass. However, if any good message has ever been given one of coming happiness or wealth, harbor and expect it, and it will manifest sooner or later through the law of expectancy. Man's will should be used to back the universal will. I will that the will of God be done. It is God's will to give every man every righteous desire of his heart, and man's will should be used to hold the perfect vision without wavering. The prodigal son said, I will arise and go to my father. It is indeed often an effort of the will to leave the husks and swine of mortal thinking. It is so much easier for the average person to have fear than faith. So faith is an effort of the will. As man becomes spiritually awakened, he recognizes that any external inharmony is the correspondence of mental inharmony. If he stumbles or falls, he may know he is stumbling or falling in consciousness. One day, a student was walking along the street, condemning someone in her thoughts. She was saying mentally, that woman is the most disagreeable woman on earth. When suddenly, three Boy Scouts rushed around the corner and almost knocked her over. She did not condemn the Boy Scouts, but immediately called on the law of forgiveness and saluted the divinity in the woman. Wisdom's ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. When one has made his demands upon the universal, he must be ready for surprises. Everything may seem to be going wrong, when in reality it is going right. For example, a woman was told that there was no loss in divine mind. Therefore, she could not lose anything which belonged to her. Anything lost would be returned, or she would receive its equivalent. Several years previously, she had lost $2,000. She had loaned the money to a relative during her lifetime, but the relative had died, leaving no mention of it in her will. The woman was resentful and angry, and as she had no written statement of the transaction, she never received the money, so she determined to deny the loss and collect the $2,000 from the Bank of the Universal. She had to begin by forgiving the woman, as resentment and unforgiveness closed the door of this wonderful bank. She made this statement, I deny loss. There is no loss in divine mind. Therefore, I cannot lose the two thousand dollars which belong to me by divine right. As one door shuts, another opens. She was living in an apartment house which was for sale and in the lease was a clause stating that if the house was sold the tenants would be required to move out within ninety days suddenly the landlord broke the leases and raised the rent 
Again, injustice was on her pathway, but this time she was undisturbed. She blessed the landlord and said, As the rent has been raised, it means that I'll be that much richer, for God is my supply. The new leases were made out for the advanced rent, but by some divine mistake, the ninety-day clause had been forgotten. Soon after, the landlord had an opportunity to sell the house. On account of the mistake in the new leases, the tenants held possession for another year. The agent offered each tenant $200 if he would vacate. Several families moved. Three remained, including the woman. A month or two passed, and the agent again appeared. This time he said to the woman, "'Will you break your lease for the sum of $1,500?' It flashed upon her, here comes the $2,000. She remembered having said to friends in the house, we will all act together if anything more is said about leaving. So her lead was to consult her friends. These friends said, well, if they have offered you 1500 they will certainly give 2000 So she received a check for $2,000 for giving up the apartment. It was certainly a remarkable working of the law, and the apparent injustice was merely an opening for the way for her demonstration. It proved that there is no loss, and when man takes his spiritual stand, he collects all that is his from this great reservoir of good. I will restore to you the years the locusts have eaten. The locusts are the doubts, fears, resentments, and regrets of mortal thinking. These adverse thoughts alone rob man, for no man gives to himself but himself, and no man takes away from himself but himself. Man is here to prove God and to bear witness to the truth. And he can only prove God by bringing plenty out of lack and justice out of injustice. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there shall be not room enough to receive it. End of chapter 8